Good morning, church. Wherever you are, would you stand or sit or sip your coffee and sing along with us this morning? Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Upon the Lord. Our God, you reign forever. Our hope, our strong Amen. Amen. We, we, we welcome each of you on this rainy Sabbath morning on July the 12th to worship. What a privilege it is for us to be in your home. We welcome each of you online to our live stream. We're grateful to Jeff Wood and our praise team for leading us. As many of you know, we are beginning our new worship times today. Uh, we are not yet in person. We had originally planned today to be uh, have a smaller group here, but we're postponing that uh, for just a few more weeks, and we welcome each of you to this uh, new order of service on Sunday morning, 8.30. Our modern uh, praise band will be with us. If you'd like to tune in a little later today at 11 a.m., we'll have one of our chancel choir ensembles that will be leading us in more traditional music. But what a joy it is to be with you in your home. Uh, some of you are here in Brentwood in Williamson County, others in Nashville, Middle Tennessee, and indeed throughout the nation. And it is a great honor and privilege to worship God with you, to be in your homes wherever you are to share in the worship of God. We pray today will be a significant hour in your life as we seek to be closer to God, as we seek to live like Christ, and we seek to commend the Holy Spirit to each of you. Uh, I invite now Reverend Toy King to come and lead us in our call to worship. Thank you, Brother Davis. Good morning, friends. I invite you wherever you are, maybe you're in your living room or at the kitchen table, I invite you to stand if you're able at home as we read our call to worship this morning. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a land of suffering? We shall sing of courage and the strength of the Lord. How shall we sing the Lord's song when we feel lonely? 
We shall sing of unity and faithfulness, of reconciliation and hope. Come, let us sing the Lord's song this day. Let us praise God in all our ways forever. Amen. To our God we lift up one voice, to our God we lift up one song, to our God we lift up one voice, singing hallelujah. To our God we lift up one voice, to our God we lift up one song, to our God we lift up one voice, singing hallelujah. from the ashes your love has brought us out of the darkness into the light lifting our sorrows bearing our burdens healing our hearts to a God we lift up one voice to a God we lift up one song to a God we lift up one voice singing hallelujah wherever you've been come broken hearted 
Let rescue begin. Come find your mercy. Oh, sinner, come near. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can heal. Earth has no sorrow heaven can heal. So lay down your burden. There's hope for the hopeless and all those who stray. Come sit at the table, come taste the grace. There's rest for the weary, rest that endures. Earth has no sorrow, heaven can cure. Earth has no sorrow, heaven can cure. So lay Thank you so much. Oh, Lord Jesus. I feel the spirit in this house, y'all. Friends, I invite us, if we're able, to say our affirmation of faith together. Let us say it. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, 
to celebrate God's presence, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus, crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. I think I have learned what God is continuing to try to teach me, to be honest. I feel like it's a lesson that um, He's been trying to teach me for a while. And I think that's just to um, be present and not worry so much about tomorrow and the day after and the day after that. Um, I'm the type of person that I like to plan. I like to be organized. I like to have my calendar with everything written out. My youngest daughter was a senior in high school. So when you talk about plans, I mean, we had so many plans. Um, end of school stuff, prom, graduation, graduation parties. The summer was jam packed with things to do. Last moments as a family, because she's our youngest, so William and I are looking forward to being empty nesters. You know, the kids were going to be gone. And surprise, surprise, <laughs> the kids are not gone. The kids came home for spring break and never left. So um, plans went out the window. And there were moments where we were mad, we were sad, confused. What do you do? And just had to stop and take a breath and realize that it's okay. We have today. Um, I actually started a rule in my house, and the rule is if it's a week away, we're not gonna talk about it. And it made some people grumpy, but I just got to a point where I had to, that was about all I could control, is the next few days ahead of us. And I just saw that when we tried to look ahead, we started spinning. And I just really think that that was God trying to say, you've got to stop. You've got to just enjoy today. Think about today. Enjoy today. Don't worry about tomorrow. But I've found it's almost given me some freedom. It's been nice to not have to worry about next month. It's been nice to just get up in the morning and say to my family, what do we want to do today? What do you feel like doing? What, what are you hungry for this morning? It's these little moments that I now can say, we wouldn't have had them. And we're going outside and we're going for family walks and we're going kayaking and we're having discussions, we're eating dinner outside at the dinner table every night instead of, you know, hoping to get it in two or three nights a week. It's every night. And that's awesome. It's a gift that started out as something that was stressful, something that has been in my head throughout this time is this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, not tomorrow, not next week. This is the day. And I have to rejoice and I have to be glad in today. And I'm thankful that I have my faith. I'm thankful that I have God to look to and know that he's got it. He's got it covered. I don't have to worry about it. I just can enjoy, enjoy today. Thank you, Dana, for your good word today, a good word for all of us. 
And as we prepare ourselves to go to God in prayer, I would remind you that the prayer request list, those who have asked prayer of us, um, you can find that on the webpage at bumc.net backslash live. And um, we have one name to add to that list today, and that is Gary Collier has been brought to our attention. And if you would like to submit a prayer request, you can find that um, prayer request form also uh, at bumc.net backslash care. And that's where you can um, invite us to be in prayer with you and for you, and we would love to be able to do that. Let us go to God in prayer. God of grace and God of light. We come with all of who we are to worship and praise you. We come confessing our failures and asking for your forgiveness. We come with an abiding joy and gratitude and with broken hearts. We come knowing that only before you are we fully known and fully free. We release ourselves into your hands so that you can redeem us, transform us, and use us. Draw us ever more deeply into your kingdom work. Awaken us where we are asleep and agitate us where we are complacent. We pray that you will heal the brokenness, brokenness in us, between us, and around us, all that is broken in our bodies, in our families, and in the world. For those who are sick, grieving, or wayward this day, blow your spirit over them and touch them. Be with the family and friends who love them and who are worried and fearful. For those who are lonely or isolated, especially in these trying times, God, give them strength. For those who are struggling with job loss and economic uncertainty, provide for them and open doors of opportunity. Continue to bless and watch over the medical professionals who are caring for our sick loved ones near and far, and for the medical scientists who are tirelessly working to develop vaccines and treatments, not only for COVID, God, but for all forms of disease. We lift to you our parents, teachers, and school administrators as they work to forge a path to safely return to school. Provide wisdom, a clear vision, and a way. Throughout this world, O oh God, suppress all forms of violence. Protect any person who is being harassed, abused, or victimized. Bring forth and empower leaders who seek justice and peace and who strive to walk humbly and mercifully, always seeking to do what is right and good according to your will. Bring all people together into your kingdom vision. Do not allow us to continue to strive against one another over our differences, but show us how to work for the common good. For in you, we are all one. Help us to know one another and to love one another as you call us to do. In all things, draw us near and hold us in the hope of our Lord Jesus Christ. We offer all these things to you for your redemptive blessing and your transforming love. And hear us now as together we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Today's Old Testament lesson is from the book of Psalm, chapter 137. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down, and there we wept when we remembered Zion. 
On the willows, there we hung up our harps. For there our captors asked us for songs, and our tormentors asked us for mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How could we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my hand wither. Let my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth. If I do not remember you, if I do not set Jerusalem above my highest joy, remember, O Lord, against the Edomites the day of Jerusalem's fall, how they said, tear it down, tear it down, down to the foundations. O daughter Babylon, you devastator, happy shall they be who pay you back what you have done to us. Happy shall they be who take your little ones and dash them against the rock. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Justin, for reading for us, for leading us in the recitation of this prayer poem, Psalm 137. We are beginning a new series this morning called Lessons from the Quarantine. And I want to join uh, Laura in thanking Dana Orange for sharing her personal insights in our video this morning. Her testimony is, I think, to all of us a reminder that we are most teachable in our seasons of distress. We are most teachable in those moments of crisis when life doesn't go exactly as we had planned. In fact, it's, it's one of our core values as a church that, that we're to be teachable all of our lives. As disciples of Jesus, we, we are lifetime learners, lifetime students. And of course, it's no accident that the word for disciple in the Greek language means literally student or learner, pupil. And so I know I'm preaching to the choir when I tell you today that it is absolutely critical, absolutely critical to our spiritual formation, to our sanctification, that we continue to grow in godly wisdom and understanding as we attempt to live out our faith in what feels often like shifting sand. To the text. Psalm 137 was actually composed in the midst of a crisis, not just a political crisis, but a religious crisis, a faith crisis. In fact, the language that's being used by the psalmist is of the genre of lament or lamentation. A lament is a sad song. It's, it's a poetic prayer that gives voice to the deepest emotions of the human soul. It articulates our feelings of grief, our, our feelings of fear, our feelings of pain and anguish, frustration, disillusionment, and anger. All of which, by the way, as you may have noticed in Justin's reading, is a part of the psalm. Even those last three verses, which I know when he read them, you, like I do, feel so uncomfortable. The last three verses are so offensive to our modern sensibilities, but even there in this lament, the psalmist includes those raw instincts that are a part of us. He includes them not as a license for us to justify our need to retaliate, but he includes them as a means of identifying this innate impulse of one who's victimized, of one who is abused, of one who is humiliated alienated and oppressed. And to be sure, the human experience includes these feelings, these desires sometimes for vengeance and retribution. There's no denying it. And yet, since it is a prayer, this is God's way of saying that it is absolutely imperative to pray it out instead of act it out. I'm reminded of Paul's words to the Romans in chapter 12, verse 19. Do not take revenge, dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. 
saith the Lord, I will repay. Romans 12, 19, that's a direct quote, by the way, from Deuteronomy 32, verse 35. And so I think the fact that one-third, roughly one-third of these psalms are laments is God's way of saying to us, I give you permission to air your grievance. I give you my blessing to vent out your frustration in prayer. I've discovered as a pastor that a part of pastoral care includes hearing the pain and angst of my neighbor without telling my neighbor how they should feel. I've never found that to be helpful to tell someone how should they feel. Now, it's important also to add that we ought not to act out every feeling, but you cannot argue with a person's feelings. I remember as a boy growing up in the 70s here in Nashville, There used to be a radio show on, I think it was WMAK, it could have been WKDA, a radio program that aired on Friday nights, which was called Crying Time. Uh, Some of you are old enough to remember that, Crying Time, which was based on an old Buck Owens song that he wrote, I think, in 1966 that was made famous by Ray Charles. I still remember the words. Oh, it's crying time again. You're going to leave me. I can see that far away look in your eye. I can tell by the way you hold me, darling, that it won't be long before it's crying time. And on Friday nights, for two hours, the DJ would play these lamentations, these sad songs. And I don't know why, but in my teenage mind where where I felt all of these emotions, there was something about it that was comforting to me, it was consoling. It still is sometimes still. I need to hear the voice, the sound of B.B. King. I need to hear Eric Clapton and Vince Gill sing the blues sometimes. There's something about those songs that mesh with my soul, songs that express what we often suppress, what we hide. Many of us were taught to mask our tears so as not to appear as though we're weak or overly sensitive, but God gives us permission to cry. In fact, if you know Jesus, Jesus knew how to cry. Jesus wept. He cried at the tomb of Lazarus, his best friend. He cried in the garden of Gethsemane on the night before he gave his life. He cried one night from the mountain, weeping over Jerusalem as he prayed for the holy city. The truth of the matter is God gives us permission to weep, and God hears us when we cry. Isn't it ironic that the most redemptive act in human history, the exodus of the Hebrew people from Egyptian slavery begins with one line in Exodus 3, verse 7, where God says, I have seen the misery of my people in Egypt, and I have heard their cries. That's the beginning of redemption, of Exodus. I don't know who said it, but I agree with it. Crying is how the heart speaks when the lips can't explain. God gives us permission to lament. Chapter 137 was composed, it was written in the darkest days of the history of Judea. We call it the exile. The year was 587 BCE. Nebuchadnezzar's troops stormed the holy city. They destroyed Jerusalem. They burned the temple. They deported the leading citizens, the rulers, the princes and princesses, the prophets and the priests. They left the poor in Jerusalem to till the land, but without the infrastructure, without any of the symbolism that defined their identity and their heritage. They banished the brightest and best to Babylon. From Jerusalem to Babylon, it was about 900 miles. It would take them four months to make that trail of tears. The Hebrew people were not strangers to wandering in the wilderness. They had done this before, you remember, during the Exodus. But that was a different trip. 
In the Exodus story, the Hebrews were moving towards a promise, but in the exile, they're moving away from a promise. And suddenly, the favored are feeling rather unfavored, and the chosen are feeling unchosen. Among those deported refugees were the likes of Ezekiel, Deutero uh, Isaiah, and one of those refugees was named Jeremiah. In fact, Jeremiah wrote an, a collection, an anthology of sad songs depicting this time. It's called Lamentations. It's in your Bible. We seldom read it. It's painful. But I want to give you just a taste of Jeremiah's version of crying time. Lamentations 1, listen to this. How empty the city, once teeming with people. A widow, this city, once in the front rank of nations, once queen of the ball, she's now a drudge in the kitchen. She cries herself to sleep at night, tears soaking her pillow. No one's left among her lovers to sit and hold her hand. Her friends have all dumped her. After years of pain and hard labor, Judah has gone into exile. She camps out among the nations she never feels at home. Hunted by all, she's stuck between a rock and a hard place. Zion's roads weep, empty of pilgrims headed to the feasts. All her city gates are deserted, her priests in despair. Her virgins are sad. How bitter her fate. Her enemies have become her masters. Her foes are living it up because God laid her low, punishing her repeated rebellions. Her children, prisoners of the enemy, trudge in a trail of tears in exile. Is it any wonder that the glue of those pages in your Bible are still glued together? We don't read those kinds of things. We don't want to appear negative or weepy or fearful. To make matters worse, when the exiles set up their camp at one of those uh, river canals, which was actually an irrigation ditch of the river Euphrates, the captors demanded that they have a hymn sing. Not because the tormentors wanted to join in the lyrics, in fact, they did it, says the Scripture, for mirth, for humiliation, for their own amusement and entertainment. They said, sing us one of those old songs of Zion. But every time they opened their mouths, the words were not there. The music was gone. And all they could do <laughs> was to weep. They lost their home. They lost their land. They lost their church. They lost their history, they lost their culture, and now they're losing their song. Listen to the imagery of the psalmist. And they hung their guitars, their harps, in the poplar trees. And they looked at each other and said, how can we sing that song in this God-forsaken place? They're lamenting. One of the most difficult things, I think, for us in our quarantine, in this pandemic, has been the loss of music. It's a tough thing when Music City ceases to make music. The Skirmerhorn is closed. The Bridgestone is locked. The chancel is nearly empty. There's no choir. There's no orchestra. There's no bells. And quite frequently, these last few months, we have resorted to old recordings. Old songs of Zion that frankly sometimes haunt us and bring us to tears. We can't fill the choir loft during these days as we did just six months ago. And as a result of that, we're learning something. We are rediscovering the vitality of music to our faith. It is the language of the soul, isn't it? There's something about music that takes us back. Whenever I hear love lifted me, I'm taken back to a campground in Georgia where I'm singing with the saints. 
Whenever I hear the hymn, Here I Am, Lord, I'm in this sanctuary packed with lay people and pastors who are trying to outsing each other and lift up the dome with their praises to God as we ordain pastors for ministry. Whenever I hear that old song, Pass It On, I, I find myself sitting on a stone wall at Bersheba Springs as a teenager rededicating my life to Jesus. It's painful when the music ceases. The last in-person gathering that we had in this place was on Sunday afternoon, March 8th. It was right after the tornado, you remember, and the combined choirs and the praise band filled this space with their songs of praise, and it was a revival. I still remember Jeff leading us in Is He Worthy, Chris Tomlin's beautiful song, which is my new favorite, and the place was full of people in praise. But not so today. And so the question, how do we sing the Lord's song with a mask on our mouth? How do we sing the songs of Zion in the midst of a crisis? This is the question of the psalmist. This is the query of those refugees, but it's not just about music. It's about faith. What they're really asking is, has God forgotten us? Has God abandoned His people? Has God rejected me? Is God now unchoosing us? They're losing their song. In ancient days, historians tell us that it was believed if your nation suffered the defeat of another nation, then their God was bigger than yours. And here's what would happen. The victims would recede or forfeit their confession and give allegiance to the new tribal God of the victorious nation. But this did not happen with these Jews. They kept singing. <laughs> they never lost their song. In fact, in the Psalm 137, they made covenant. They vowed to never forget. Listen to verses 5 and 6. If I forget, O Jerusalem, may my right hand wither. What is that? That's the hand of the conductor that leads the music. If I forget you, Jerusalem, let my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth. If I don't remember you, what's that? That's the tongue of the singers who are singing the songs. The two body parts that are absolutely necessary for making music, they vow to lose should they forget Jerusalem. I, I, I don't think that we see sometimes the miracle that the Jews actually survived as a race, as a people. The policy of the Babylonians was to amalgamate the defeated nation into the predominant culture so that they would gradually lose their language, lose their tradition, lose their culture, lose their history, and lose their faith. This was a form of ethnic cleansing but it didn't happen <laughs> to these Jews. Why? Because they never lost their song. <laughs> they kept singing in an irrigation ditch. They held on to their faith. They never bowed the knee to a lesser God, and they never forgot Yahweh, and Yahweh never forgot them. This is the God who remembers His promise, who remembers His vow, even when we forget ours, who remembers His people, even when His people forget Him. Oh, it's amazing to me the power of memory to preserve your faith. 
Hundreds of times the word, the Hebrew word zakar, which means imprint, memory. You see it in the scriptures over and over. Remember the rock from which you were hewn. Remember your creator in the days of your youth. Remember the deeds of old in the midnight. Remember his name and keep his statutes. Do this in remembrance of me. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom And the Holy Spirit will bring to your remembrance all that I have said. Remember your first love. Over and over, memory. What do you suppose the Hebrews learned in the midst of their quarantine? They learned a number of things that we're going to talk about the next few weeks. But I want to tell you, I think the first vital lesson that they learned in the quarantine. They discovered that God God is not confined to the temple. God is not restricted to any sanctuary, to any institution. God is not confined even to a ritual or a sacrificial system or a place or a city or a politic. They discovered in no uncertain terms that God was just as present in the refugee camp as he was in the Holy of Holies. These exiles settled in Babylon, sure, as Jeremiah 29 commanded. They assimilated somewhat into a Babylonian culture. Some even took on Babylonian names, like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But they never became Babylonians. They were first and foremost sons and daughters of God. And they never forgot it. And neither did God. As people of faith, as those who define themselves fundamentally through water and the laying on of hands, I tell you, we too are exiles. You're a resident alien, and so am I. We are called of God to live in Babylon without being of Babylon. To be in the world, but not of the world, and that makes of us exiles. Peter said it in his first epistle, chapter 2, verse 11. Dear friends, remember that you don't belong to this world. You are temporary residents. You're living in exile. So resist the desires of the flesh that battle for your citizenship and your soul. There's one other psalm that speaks to this insight And that's Psalm 90, verse 1, which, by the way, was also written by one of these exiles in Babylon. He writes these words, Thou, O Lord, hast been our home in all generations. He learned the same thing, that home is not just a place. It's a relationship. In fact, it's possible to be at home even in the most unpromising situation, not because of where you are, but because of who is with you, provided that you never stop singing, you never lose your song. Last word. When I was a young pastor in South Atlanta, in Fayetteville, Georgia, I used to lead worship from time to time in one of our assisted living homes. I can see her in my mind's eye right now, one of the residents there, a woman who had lost her feet because of diabetes. Each Sunday afternoon, she would come in her wheelchair with her spiritual life songbook from which we sang. She never missed. She tolerated my sermons but she loved those songs. She lived for music. 
I've never seen a face so full of joy. In fact, when I would begin the songs, sometimes on key, you could hear her voice above the others singing these old songs of Zion. And I have to tell you, there were times that I went home and I wondered, how on earth can she, in her situation, sing with such joy? And I asked her about it one day. How do you do it, Mrs. Johnson? And she said, preacher boy. She always called me preacher boy. Preacher boy, those old songs take me to places that my feet have never been. (laughs) She is obviously not from around here. She's an alien. She's an exile in an uncharted territory who has never lost her song. And the remembrance of a God who never forgets. That's our salvation. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. sisters, we've heard the word of God. I pray that we will not stop singing. At this time, we invite you to give. We invite you to go online to bumc.net backslash live and to give. And also, we invite you to make sure you register your attendance online. Now, remember, when we were in the house together, you want to get credit for worship today. So I invite you to give, and I invite you to register. And once again, may we continue to sing. Amen. Do you feel the world's broken? We do. Do you feel the shadows deepen? We do. But do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? We do. Do you wish that you could see it all? Is anyone whole? Is anyone 
He is worthy. Amen. Amen. He is worthy. Friends, what a joy it has been to be with you in worship today. Uh, as we close, before our benediction, I want to share a great celebration that will be music to your ears. Uh, I wrote about it in the e-note on Friday. Uh, but last Thursday evening, we had the privilege of commissioning 12 new Stephen ministers in our midst, and we are so, so grateful. I, I think this is a historic first uh, in that over the last four months, these 12 have been trained completely online. And so in the midst of our social distancing, uh, they have been trained in this embodied form of ministry, and they are ready to serve. And for this, we're very grateful. I want to say a special word of thanks, first of all, to Jan and Phil Jamison. Uh, many of you know Jan and Phil. They're regulars in our church. Uh, and Phil is a pastor who is now serving as the director of the foundation for the Tennessee Conference. And what a special couple. Uh, they have devoted this time over the last four months to training these new leaders, Stephen ministers, who are prepared now to serve. Uh, we're so thankful to the Jameson. Now, if we go back to the slide of our 12 Stephen ministers, I want to call their names and you can pick them out. Gina Brawley, Al Dorsey, Pappy Drawn, Betty Drawn, Bill Yeager, Linda McCaffrey, Pam McCormick, Steve Mitchell, Jeff Phillips, Joe Rogers, Debbie Slocum, Christy Warren. And also, we had the privilege of commissioning a new Stephen leader who will be a trainer for us, and that is Ann Adams. And so we celebrate with these dear ones, with their family members who support them, and with all of you as we support them with our prayers. And now would you receive this benediction. We thank you, holy God, for calling us, for equipping us, for empowering us wherever we are and for never forgetting your promise to us. It is your promise, O God, that is music to our souls. And so we pray that you would keep us singing to the one who never forgets his own. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Is he worthy? Is he worthy? Is he worthy?